Excellent. Um, no, thanks very much, Adam. It's a, a pleasure to uh, come and talk. Um, and I am talking on behalf of our research group here. Um, so my name is Martin Bush. I'm based in History and Philosophy of Science at Melbourne University. And I'm part of the interdisciplinary meta research group there, um, which is headed by Professor Fiona Fiddler. Um, who would give um, a much more detailed um, talk than I'm going to give today, but um, I'll, I'll take a slightly different take on it um, than Fiona would. So meta-research, um, for those of you who haven't heard the term, is the, um, the discipline which looks at studying scientific research with a view, with an explicit view of understanding and improving its methodology. So um, obviously there's lots of uh, studies of science within history and philosophy of science. Meta research is doing so with a specific aim to improve its methodologies. Um, and I've got my main contact email there for anyone who wants to follow up on anything that I'll talk about. Um, and I, so I'll be talking about, briefly talk about the, well, I'll be talking about the replication crisis, what it is and what's causing it. Um, I'll have a bit of a theme for my talk, will be public trust in science um, and what we actually mean by that. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about the Replicates project a little bit, which is the main research project from the interdisciplinary meta research group. Okay, but um, it is a theme in my talk to talk about uh, trust in science. Um, so, you know, sort of presumably many, if not everyone in this room would feel comfortable saying something like, we trust science. Um, but of course, what does this mean? Um, it's a big subject and I'm only going to treat a little bit of it, but I want to outline what we may, might mean by it. And, and of course, as an academic, we can problematize all of those words. What does it mean to be a we? Um, what is trust? And um, of course, many, many volumes have been written about what exactly we mean by science. Um, so uh, in a full meaning of trust, there's a number of things that are suggested by that term. Um, I've got them listed there, an expectation of good faith behaviour on the person that you're trusting, the, um, the understanding of the ability of that person, the trustee, to, to deliver something to you, um, the intention by the trustor to do something and hope that it all works out. So when I say, I trust that Adam will give me that big bag of cash at the end of this meeting, um, I expect that he's going to, um, in good faith behaviour, I um, understand that he does have a big bag of cash there for me. Um, I am agreeing to do something um, willingly. I'm giving this talk in my good faith and I'm hoping that it all works out. And at the end of this night, um, I'm going to be a lot richer than I walked in this room. So um, that's, that, those are the kinds of things that um, trust signifies. Um, but can science, what is science? Can science be trusted in this way? Um, and there's a lot of people who would argue that it's actually a mismatch of concepts to say that a process or a collective collection of processes or results can be trusted in this way. It's not the kind of thing that can be trusted, but institutions certainly can. Um, and there are many, obviously, scientific institutions. And so, um, there is a way that the term we trust science can bleed into the statement we trust scientific institutions or even we trust the government's management of scientific institutions and of science in a way that there's, um, that there's a slippage of meaning there. And I think for me, um, if I was giving the full version of this talk, I would talk more about that. But I think some of the interesting things around trust in science occur precisely in that slippage. Um, so if we were to consider that full range of trust in institutions and trust in government, the kinds of things that we would need to consider are uh, the role that these institutions play within democratic process. On the one, at one end, you could have a technocracy where 
all these decisions are made by experts with no reference whatsoever to the public. At the other end, you have people voting on funding for every single um, scientific research project or indeed voting on what facts they like. Um, and obviously both ends of that continuum, I think most people would consider to be undesirable, but finding the sweet spot in the middle is um, a bit, bit harder. Um, we need to think about uh, the, the way that people identify, identify um, with or against scientists, um, and the, uh, with, along with that comes the ideas of perspectival thinking. Uh, it's very common in scientific uh, literature or scientific rhetoric to think of a kind of um, neutral subject and neutral logic. Um, even within the science process, we know that that's not tr strictly true, or certainly not always strictly true, but certainly when it comes to public reasoning, the idea of, um, of situated reasonings and motivated reasonings is, is um, the norm rather than the exception. Um, and along with that comes the kinds of bounded rationalities where people make judgments on subjects, including scientific subjects, without necessarily understanding the full detail of them, they make judgments by reference to the kinds of associations that occur. So in the way that climate change science becomes associated with left-wing concerns, so people that distrust left-wing concerns start to distrust climate science, or conversely, genetic engineering technology gets associated with the concerns of agribusiness, so the kinds of people that distrust agribusiness start to distrust um, genetic modification. And all of those judgments can be made without um, anyone even attempting to make a full understanding of the sciences involved. So uh, that's the kind of reasoning practices that go on um, in, the, in the public domain. Um, and finally, we also have to think about imaginaries because when people are making judgments about science, they're not necessarily making judgments about the actual practices of scientists. They're making judgments about what they imagine the results um, of science might be. Um, and this, you know, sort of along with the different perspectives that people come, brings up a whole lot of um, issues about um, how those imaginaries are constructed, um, what are they based around, um, and what ends, what are, they, what are they constructed for. So that's the full kinds of things that we would need to talk about in a, in a full talk about public trust on um, science, and I won't be doing that tonight. Um, what I will be talking about with trust is a much more restricted understanding of trust a sort of an epistemic trust, which I think is much more um, related to uh, what people would say when they say we trust science, and that is something along the lines of scientific research can be expected to produce knowledge reliable enough to form the basis for action. How reliable is that? Well, that depends on what action you're going to take. We expect that the um, planes we get in are not going to fall down out of the sky almost ever. We expect that the medicines that we take are going to make us better or at least not make us much worse. But if we were, you know, the sicker we are, the more likely we are to take, you know, more experimental medication uh, and, and so forth. So um, how reliable the knowledge you want is really going to depend on what you're expecting to do with it. But as an overall statement, we expect that scientific research produces reliable knowledge. Um, now, this does actually include many of those elements of trust that I talked about before. It includes the elements of good faith um, by scientific researchers. It includes um, the idea that science can deliver something to us, something tangible benefits to us, um, and certainly that we hope that that's going to work out well. Um, but it doesn't have that element of personal, I don't have a personal relationship with science and I'm not doing something for science. It, it doesn't have that aspect of trust um, involved with it. Notice that the good faith element here is actually important because that rules out scientific fraud, right? And we know that scientific fraud happens. It's a problem. Um, there's some high profile examples. Um, Diderik Staple, um, the guy, who um, made up those studies that associate, for example, one of the famous ones was um, associating the cleanliness of train stations or the dirtiness of train stations with invoking racial prejudice 
in people, um, completely made up study as it turns out. Um, and uh, recently where we've got a, um, a alleged fraud case um, uh, involving some spider research, which is it's just sort of emerging at the moment. Um, so scientific fraud certainly exists and it is corrosive of trust. Certainly it's corrosive of the trust relationship when we understand that scientists are not acting in good faith, but it's actually easy to manage. You know, we um, condemn it. We don't give people who engage in fraud jobs anymore. We retract their papers. It's, it's a relatively easy problem to deal with and it's quite small. It's actually not a big part of the reliability story that I'm talking about tonight. So um, is scientific research producing reliable knowledge at the moment? Well, is there a problem? Um, and the replication crisis indicates that there is actually a problem with science in at least some contexts delivering reliable knowledge. Um, replication crisis has roots going back many decades, but it, the recent um, interest in it goes back to about 2010. Uh, in psychology, a uh, paper in 2011 by Daryl Bem um, basically tried to demonstrate that extrasensory perception exists. Um, most practicing, uh, most research scientists, most research psychologists don't believe in extrasensory perception, so people tried to uh, replicate the methods and unsurprisingly, several labs replicated the experiments and found that the results didn't replicate, that there was no evidence they could find for extrasensory perception. But when these replication studies went to be published, they were told, sorry, we don't publish replication. We don't publish this kind of um, derivative research. So a paper that, um, you know, sort of suggests that something that is fundamentally implausible can get into the, into the journal, but replication studies that provide strong evidence that that original paper was wrong can't get published. That's a big problem. It's a problem that the first paper got published, but, you know, mistakes happen everywhere. The fact that the journal refused to correct that mistake on the record, a major problem. So that, that was when um, interest really took off in psychology. Um, and that prompted a large-scale replication project run by the Open Science Foundation by Brian Nosek. Um, it ended up being published in 2015, and I'll uh, give some results for that. What um, Uh, now, I'm not a psychologist, it was, um, I can check that, but I th I'm pretty sure it was psych science. Um, was that a top tier journal? It was one of the top journals, yeah. Um, well, considered to be one of the top journals. Its reputation certainly took a bit of a hit with its, um, with its approach. So by this stage, by 2005, in a completely different area in biomedical science, um, John Ioannidis had published a very famous essay, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, um, in which he outlined many of the problems that I will get to. Um, and this spurred some interest in biomedical uh, fields to undertake replication, um, uh, replication studies, and so in 2012, uh, Glenn Begley from Amgen undertook a replication of um, 100, uh, tried to undertake um, 100 replication studies of uh, landmark studies in preclinical um, medicine. They ended up uh, doing 53, completing 53 replication studies of that 53 replications in preclinical biology, six replicated, six out of 53. Um, so we've got in biomedical science, poor replication rates. We've got in psychology, poor replication rates and poor practice. All of a sudden in the early two, uh, 2010s, uh, there's people are starting to take it seriously. Um, so we now, as a result of some of those studies have good evidence that in at least some fields or subfields of research, perhaps only around about half of the published findings are reliable. And that's not great, you know, 50%, the glib answer to say as well, you know, 
if you could get 50% at the racetrack, you could make yourself a rich person. 50% is not that bad, but I think you know most people would have higher expectations for scientific research than 50% of the stuff coming out. Um, how big is the problem really? Um, actually, no one knows. We just don't know. We've done replications, large-scale replication projects in a number of fields. Most of those have found problems, but how it um, exists in other fields, um, we're not in a position to know at the moment. But it certainly is widespread. So there's some of the uh, large-scale replication studies that have been done, and you can see that they've been done in psychology and preclinical medicine, and I've described other studies in biology, computational neuroscience, economics, social science, experimental philosophy, which um, has so far had the best. Still going? Yeah, just put it in your pocket. Yeah. Um, which so far experimental philosophy has had the best replication rates of any um, any disciplines being tested. And we don't know why, but some suspicion is that it's a, a new field and there's a bit of low hanging fruit there. So they're testing more, you know, sort of straightforwardly, you know, obvious claims compared to some of the other fields. But we really we don't know. But even there, it's only about seventy percent. That's um, that's that's not awesome. It's good by replication standards. So we've got we do have um, a large number of fields that are producing this replicability problem. Um, and when you, if you just do the so look at the social sciences, so put the preclinical medicine um, and experimental philosophy aside for the moment. If you just look at the social sciences, um, the average uh, of these studies is around about forty six percent. So about fifty four percent of the claims in the literature are potentially false positives. Um, there are different things going on in different disciplines, and I'll return to that point a little bit later on. So why, what's causing the um, replication crisis? There are a lot of things and um, one of them is statistical malpractice or bad practice at least. Um, and this statistical malpractice particularly relates to the issue of significance testing, testing for significance, uh, statistical significance, and particularly in the context of null hypothesis significance testing, that is comparing um, a putative effect with the hypothesis that nothing is going on, looking for a statistically significant difference in your experimental data from the null hypothesis, and if there is a statistically significant difference, then success. If there's no statistically significant difference, um, than failure. Uh, there is um, whole talks and Fiona is very well placed to give many of these talks about um, the history of how null hypothesis significance testing came to be and uh, the misunderstandings that exist amongst practicing science today about what significance testing means. But for the purpose of this talk, um, all we need to know is that over the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, null hypothesis significance testing and the use of statistical significance has remained a benchmark of success in many um, statistically based experimental disciplines like psychology. Um, the problem is that this kind of significance testing is amenable to various kinds of poor practice um, like p-hacking, cherry picking, and harking. So um, what are they? So there's a visual uh, definition of p-hacking, um, but it is indeed simply the use of various choices or techniques within your experimental protocols to massage the significance um, results that you get uh, in order to get them, um, you know, what you like. So examples of practices that might be considered p-hacking is excluding it, looking at data and going, ah, oh, this, I haven't got a st significant effect, but this data over here is clearly an outlier. How about we exclude them and then see if the result is statistically significant? Or looking at the data and going, we haven't reached statistical significance yet. Why don't we just collect a few more and see whether that gets us over the line? Um, 
rounding p-values. I've got a, you know, I've got a significance value of 0.051. Well, you know, let's just round it to, you know, sort of 0.05. Um, trying alternative forms of statistical analysis. Um, using mass RG, you doing a different way of processing your data. I, you know, I processed it using this technique and I couldn't get um, statistical significance, but how about I try another, to, another way of processing the data? Oh, look, you know, if I log transform it, all of a sudden I've got um, statistical significance. Um, so all of those things are peer hacking. Cherry picking, um, reporting only the successful. You know, we, we tested 20 things and one of them turned out to be statistically significant. Well, at 0.05, that's precisely what it means, that if you test 20 things, by chance one of them might turn out to be significant. But, you know, if we then write up the paper, we only talk about that one thing and we forget to uh, mention that actually we tested 20 things. Um, you know, sort of we report the one that um, is turned out significant. That's uh, a form of cherry picking. Um, and harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. So we collect a whole lot of data, analyze it. Oh, look, here's a statistically significant relationship. Let's write a paper that says that we were looking for this particular effect. We tested it and we found a statistically significant. Well, we already know it was statistically significant from your data, but. Um, you know, sort of again, if you're testing, if you analyze data for a whole lot of relationships, some of those relationships are going to turn out to be um, significant just by chance. Um, there's nothing, of course, wrong with exploratory research, but if you want to um, then, you know, sort of do a proper test of it, you need to then uh, develop a new experiment to test that uh, putative relationship um, and treat exploratory research as exploratory research. Um, so all of these techniques, p-hacking, cherry-picking, harking, can distort statistical significance um, tests and result in the number of statistically significant relationships that you find being much larger by chance than you would expect if you were, um, you know, sort of doing things properly. Now, you might think, you know, surely no one, um, surely these practices are rare. Well, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, they are not rare at all. Um, there's a number of people of our research group have done, and um, people have overseas have done um, surveys, studies, um, interviews with practicing scientists, asking them how many times have you, have you ever done this? How often do you do this? And um, the results are pretty consistent that these practices are not uncommon um, in scientific research. Um, why is this problem happening? I'm going to give a couple of levels. I'm going to start off on a more philosophical level um, and move to a more sociological uh, description. So um, on a philosophical level, uh, statistical tests poorly understood. Science is more than just hypothesis testing. So this kind of um, hypothesis testing framework doesn't always fit. Um, and the researcher degrees of freedom are not accounted for. So um, the statistical tests are poorly understood and one of that understanding is this idea that um, the statistical tests, tests for significance and other kinds of statistical tests are really modelled as if you just have one go. You know, do you, you make one roll of the dice, you do one shot of the arrow and you see what the result is and then you test against that. But scientific research doesn't, conducting an experiment is not like just shooting an arrow, just rolling a die. It's a whole series of steps and um, difficulties that you encounter, choices that you make in getting around those difficulties, ways to proceed. Um, so uh, running an experiment is actually a whole series of choices. And once you factor in all of those choices, that idea of, um, significance testing is, uh, you know, sort of holds much less strongly. Um, science itself is more than hypothesis testing. Uh, there are, um, again, volumes and volumes of work in the philosophy of science um, and sociology of science that critiques 
um, this model of science, but nonetheless, it's one that is, um, retains a lot of strength uh, within uh, many working scientists and um, amongst public. The idea that you have a linear set of steps whereby you generate hypotheses, you design an experiment, you run the experiment, you analyse the data, and um, you publish the results and move on. Um, as I've already suggested, running experiments never is a linear process like that. There are always lots of things going on at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of moreover, you know, sort of another problem is a lot of the activities of science aren't actually well captured by this kind of model at all. Um, there are all kinds of scientific activities like um, observational studies, like parameter measurement. Um, in physics, you can make a whole career out of just measuring a parameter. That's not really hypothesis testing at all, but it's an incredibly valuable scientific exercise. There's model building, um, which doesn't really fit into this. Um, and of course, you know, sort of theory, there's a whole lot of work that exists in science that is not hypothesis deductive testing. And yet there are a number of disciplines, and I am looking at you, psychology, that act like this is the only form of science that exists, and as a result, a whole lot of, for, a whole lot of work gets shoehorned into this model, and part along with that shoehorning comes application of null hypothesis significance testing in a really weird way um, that ends up producing results that would have been far more reliable if it had been honest about the kinds of scientific um, work that was going on in the first place. Um, and I've talked about the series of steps that go on in experiments um, and with each series of steps there's way different ways of doing it so that means that there's researcher degrees of freedom um, and this diagram indicates where on that ideal model um, the different questionable research practices um, and other things have their opportunity to rear their heads and sort of disrupt that. Um, even within that ideal model, um, there's opportunities to disrupt that. So, you know, sort of the ideal model has generating hypotheses as the first step and in interpreting the results right at the end. But the whole point about harking is that you can generate your uh, hypotheses after you've already got the um, data and, you know, you can analyse it in a number of different ways. Um, some of those ways result in p-hacking um, and um, publication bias, which I'll get to, is one of the things um, driving this whole problem in the first place. Um, I just, uh, on a very small digression, yet another departure from this ideal model um, is the role of replications themselves within science. So. Um, sociologists of science, um, Gilbert and Mulcahy, all the way back in the 1970s, conducted it, um, a series of interviews with scientists, all of whom described that, yes, replication is a really important part of the scientific process, all of whom said, yes, of course, my work is being replicated by other scientists, none of whom ever said that they replicated a single result from someone else. Um, and in fact, the estimates of the um, amount of, in the literature before the replication crisis of replication studies is about one in 1,000. About one in 1,000 papers published was a replication. So um, everyone thinks that it's really important that science produces reproducible results. No one actually was doing anything about um, checking on it. So. Um, but so moving to why do the problem happens on a sociological level um, and of course it's the um, publish or perish um, crisis. Um, publications are the currency of science, um, you know, sort of it's a cliche but it's the case um, that appointment, promotion, grant funding decisions, all of these have typically relied very heavily on people's publication records. You need to get those publications out. 
yet we've had a literature that has the um, most journals until very recently have only one and two published positive, that is to say statistically significant in these, um, in those uh, fields, only, but only providing positive results. Negative results, we did an experiment and didn't find anything. We replicated somebody else's finding. We tried to replicate and didn't find it. All of those kinds of things were absolute death knells for the ability to get published. Um, so when you've got a situation when people's careers depend on getting publications, on getting on publications fast, and on getting positive results for their publications, you can see how when QRP is there, well, we know, we know how you can get a positive result from this experiment. Or, you know, if you're, if you're close to getting a positive result, we know what the tool bag of things to do to get your experiment over the line so that you can publish it. Um, these, that's how these things become folk practices. And in fact, um, you know, sort of still to this day, there are many research labs around the world that just wouldn't accept that these uh, practices are necessarily wrong. They're, you know, it's just, it's what you do. Um, it's what you do to get your publication. So, sorry, QRP, questionable research practices, those things that I talked about before, like um, cherry picking, um, like pea hacking, collecting more data after um, you've already checked for significance without having a clearly defined stopping rule, all of those kinds of things that distort um, the application of a significance test, uh, questionable research practices. They're called questionable research practices because they're not fraud, as I just said, many of the people doing them don't necessarily know that they're wrong. They're sort of being done in good faith, in a sense. They're just bad things to do that end up distorting the results that we see in the literature. Okay, so um, we've got a handle on the size of the replication crisis in at least some areas, bad. Um, and we've got a handle on at least some of the things that are going on um, uh, to, to create it. Um, what does it mean for trust? Well, you know, sort of, unfortunately, you know, I'd say the two dominant responses to the replication crisis so far um, have been on the one hand, um, scientists who say, you can't talk about this stuff in public, you know, you're undermining the credibility of science, we've got a whole lot of people, you know, the planet's burning and people are tearing down climate science, why would you start questioning, you know, our scientific results now? You know, if we're going to talk about this, we've got to talk about it behind closed doors. On the other hand, you've got people who very explicitly are now mobilising the replication crisis in order to create doubt in all scientific findings and in all applications of science, or not all, just the ones they don't like, um, which is, you know, of course, exactly the kind of cherry picking of um, relationships that got us into the mess in the first place, but um, because these people aren't really genuinely interested in fixing the replication crisis, that probably doesn't bother them, but it does bother us. Um, you know, but at the risk of sounding like Tony Blair and hence destroying all credibility for my argument, I would say that there is in fact a third way in between this denial of the problem and saying, well, that means that, you know, sort of all science is rubbish. Uh, and this is what me and others within our research group would argue, um, that we need to openly talk about the problems that exist in science. Um, the phrase science is a self-correcting enterprise is commonly used, but science isn't a magical thing. It only self-corrects when actual scientists actually correct it. So we need to do that. Um, we need to do the hard work to improve uh, these practices. And um, I would argue that we also need to see science as a process undertaken in community, um, not just as a series of headline results. Um, so acknowledge that science is hard. Science is hard. Um, and when people, you can't do something that's hard and be successful all of the time. I mean, that's by the definition of doing something hard, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna make errors. So we need to acknowledge that scientific research generating 
interesting, insightful, novel statements about the world is a difficult thing to do. Um, and so we need to be tolerant of the fact that mistakes are always going to be made. But we need to obviously work at decreasing the rate of error production and increasing the rate of error detection and correction, um, neither of which have been a feature of the incentives of the scientific model so far, um, you know, sort of as I've mentioned. So the things that we need, we need transparency, we need more open science so that people can detect errors, and we need, but we also need to improve the quality of scientific research, the kind of practices that I've talked about in order to decrease the rate of error production in the first place. Um, there are uh, new practices on board. Um, so the open science movement has developed a lot of, um, a lot of uh, new techniques. So um, these are the kinds of badges that some journals are now awarding for um, people, researchers who make their materials open and, and um, available for scrutiny and, and hence allow people to check stuff. Um, more and more journals are now um, publishing replication studies as well as the large scale replication projects that have been done. Um, a smaller number of journals, but um, still some, are uh, introducing what are called registers reports. And the idea of registered reports is to um, eliminate or at least severely decrease publication bias by making the decision to publish happen before the experiment is actually run. So you write up your study design, you explain why you think it's an interesting and important study and what, why your methods are appropriate to it. And at that stage, the journal decides, gives an in-principle decision to publish or not. Then you run your experiment, get the results. And then that way, you're protected from, you know, sort of any, you're not required to produce a significant result. You're protected from um, that kind of rejection of negative results. Um, you write the report and then provided you've actually done what you say you do, the journal is obliged to publish the, um, publish the paper regardless. So um, registered reports, another of this kind of new practices that's available to um, correct this problem. Um, but we also, you know, a big part I've mentioned is the incentives. Um, we need to change the incentives around um, these publication metrics. A lot of people suggest quite, you know, in my view, quite correctly that we want to move to a situation where there are fewer high quality papers rather than a large number of lower quality papers. It's very difficult to imagine how you do that without also changing, without either also changing these appointment and promotion structures or otherwise disadvantaging a whole cohort of early career researchers who, you know, sort of now all of a sudden, um, you know, sort of are operating under a uh, new system or, you know, sort of don't, just won't have the publication records compared to their um, cohorts and, and are now being told you've got to slow down and um, you're, you're only allowed to publish, you know, sort of one or two papers a year. So um, there are clear things that we can do, but it's actually a bit of a whole of sector approach. We have to look at sort of all you know, a large chunk of the publishing and a large chunk of the appointment and promotion, which means a large chunk of the institutions kind of in one go. So it's, it's not an easy process um, by any means. Um, but there are clear things that can be done and there are many things that have been done. Um, and finally, you know, I suggest that um, we need to see science as a process undertaking in community rather than looking at individual results because we know that individual results can always be mistaken. Um, this does mean uh, they have implications for the way that science is reported and discussed. And some science reporters, you know, I'm pleased to say are very good at this kind of thing about not reporting all um, results as the new truth. Um, and other science reporters are really not very good at this. Um, so, you know, sort of alongside that, I'd say we need to move to um, an engagement model of science communication instead of focusing so much on people's um, 
understandings or knowledge or facts. It's about the kinds of relationships that um, people have with the science in their life. So um, there's sort of a neat parallel here. At the beginning of the talk, I started by very explicitly bracketing off um, people's uh, citizens' social relationships with institutions in terms of trust of science, but at the very end of this talk, I say that one of the things that we have to do with it is actually bracket um, back in again, understanding the scientific community's um, social relationships as a way of dealing with some of these problems. So there's sort of a neat symmetry there. Um, but, you know, I would say there's certainly a role for all of us here in having realistic expectations about what scientific uh, research is, is able to achieve um, and the kinds of people that do it. Um, and hopefully having, you know, sort of introduced you to the fact that there's a problem and given you some uh, tentative steps towards solving that problem, I can uh, now enthuse you to actually all participate yourselves in helping to solve this problem and, and we get to the paid advertisement part of the talk where I'll um, just spend a few minutes on the um, replicates project and that's what the CAT stands for, Collaborative Assessment for Trustworthy Science. Um, so I've said that we need to take replication studies seriously, and we do, but of course replication studies are expensive. Um, we're never going to get to the point where every study in the literature can be replicated. That's just, you know, sort of an in, insane um, duplication of resources, uh, making every, all research twice as expensive is not going to happen soon. So we need, um, as while we do need more replication studies, we also need ways to assess reliability that don't depend on that expense. Um, and I've talked about the need to understand science and community. So um, very neatly, this is a more cost of effective way of collaboratively in community assessing science. Um, and I'll give you our website address, um, but that's our um, website address. The, Replicates project based at the University of Melbourne led by Professor Fiona Fidler. It's part of a broader program um, funded by DARPA, US um, military uh, money, um, sadly, but um, as a end user, uh, you know, it's very interesting that DARPA as, an, as a user of research is responding to the replication crisis by saying, you know, we want for training programs and for various other things, um, we want our, to use evidence-based approaches, but how do we use evidence-based approaches in an environment where only half of the research, or half of the evidence is any good? Um, so, you know, sort of interestingly, they're funding a project to try and develop some ways of uh, working out which research is reliable or not. And um, they've uh, defined a list of particular journals, um, 60 journals across eight disciplines in the social sciences that we're having a look at at the moment. And we're looking at 3,000 articles at the moment. And should our project be refunded um, into the next 18 months, we'll have to do another 3,000 research claims. So I said that we're only one part of the overall program. So Brian Nosek and the Centre for Open Science are the people that are actually developing that list of 3,000 claims and they are also independently, over, they are overseeing independent replications of a subset of them. Um, so we have nothing to do with the claim selection, we have nothing to do with the actual replication experiments that are being performed. What we're doing is that we're taking those 3,000 claims and getting human assessments, expert assessments of the reliability of each claim. So, you know, sort of we go through each claim, you know, yeah, this one looks good, checks out. No, that one wouldn't trust, you know, sort of my pet with it. Um, Does that involve interviewing the original researchers? No, it doesn't. doesn't. No, unless they, you know, yeah. What it, I'll, I'll get to how exactly we go do it um, in the moment. There is actually another team looking at humans. Um, they're running a prediction market. So they give people, you know, sort of, a, a, a betting wallet each and they trade money over which claims they think are more or less reliable and use the aggregation of the market to, um, to, to give a score for each claim. Um, the end goal for DARPA is to not use humans at all. They want to build a science robot. 
um, that can automatically, they want a science robot that can automatically um, assign these confidence scores, but the way the program is structured is that their algorithms have to outperform our humans and our humans are measured against the kind of ground truth of the actual replication studies that are done and somehow if it all works together, DARPA will end up with an algorithm that, um, you know, sort of may or may not work. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll slip through this slide um, in the interest of time. Um, and so our protocol for making judgments about these kinds of things, collaborative process, um, it's called the IDEA protocol. Basically, it means that people, we make small groups, people investigate themselves and make a private judgment on their own. They then come together, share those judgments and share information and discuss what they think. Everyone's then given a chance to change their minds. Um, you don't have to, but typically people do change their minds a little bit. And then at the end, they make a second judgment and we use an aggregation of that second judgment from the group to form the um, collaborative evaluation. Um, read about the claim, first round feedback. Um, and this is all done online, um, on an online platform. Um, so if you log in, there's a list of claims, but um, you get some information about the claims, including a link to the actual paper itself. Um, you get to read the paper. Um, then we have a series of questions to work through. Um, and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we ask about it how well, the, how comprehensible the claim is, um, and then uh, move on to the um, replication, your um, chance of, um, of the claim replicating. Um, then in the second round, you get to, you know, sort of have a look at everyone else's judgments, um, as well as a sort of an aggregated judgment, and you get to look at the other people's reasons that they gave. So an um, interesting part of the project, and actually the part of the project that I'm working on, is looking at the reasons that people give for trusting or distrusting particular research claims. Um, and this is actually going to end up being um, probably the largest study ever done on that kind of reasoning data. Um, and, you know, because of the kind of opportunity we have, there may never be another study as large as this on, on the reasoning. So that's very exciting. Um, and that's it. So then we, we, we typically, we go through a claim, uh, we expect a person to go through a claim in about half an hour um, per claim. So um, if anyone in the room is interested in um, joining, uh, you know, sort of collaborative assessments of research claims, um, then I would encourage you all to um, visit replicates .research.unimel.edu.au where you can sign up. Um, you've seen the list of disciplines that were um, there. We don't ask the people be experts in the discipline in order to make these assessments. Um, it's not clear that experts are any better at this kind of evaluation than outsiders are. Um, and there's good reasons for thinking that actually a range of both expert and outsider opinions coming together is probably the ideal. But obviously we do ask that we do, our standard is we want people to be comfortable um, reading psychology claims or economics papers because we don't want this to be a horrible experience for our participants. Um, so we don't ask you to be an expert in psychology or economics or marketing. Um, but if you are, if you feel comfortable reading those papers and forming an opinion, that's all that we, um, you know, sort of all that we ask. Um, so that's our project, and thank you. Very Fantastic. Thank you so much for um, talking. Um, would anybody like? Have you got time to ask? Yeah, I've got questions? time. I mean, we've gone over seven thirty, um, but um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Anybody want to um, ask, ask a question? Okay, Leon, you go first. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Adam. For, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you, Mr. Martin. A uh, little bit very brief uh, about the science. We are here mm. to make celebration knowledge, reasoning, mm. and science. What is this science? Science light of life. 
Live not what you meaning. Live meaning from multi multi quantum universe to subatomic to, to big universe, planet, animal, anything, rationality. Mm. My suggest from you, I appreciate it for love and lecture. Possible you search about that. We use science, social science, neuroscience, neuroscientists, neuroprocessity. Science have no border, have, have no limit, no limitation. If you have limited definition of rationality of mankind, you are educated man, I remind you, I not judge you, I not teach you because I'm not your teacher, I'm your student. Can you explain for us how thought become where and you give us a speech? How thought become where in a scientific way? Um, I don't believe that uh, I'm very well placed to, uh, to uh, answer that, no, um, not, not. How thought become where and you give a speech? Yeah. Because we want transfer it for uh, science and technology. Mm -hmm. How be a robot become talk, think, have DNA, RNA, consciousness, soul, self, and mind. How thought become where? Mm -hmm. I think not easy yeah. question. It's a decent question that I don't think I have a decent answer for. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Them, like related yeah. to the talk. Then we can, at least we know you've got the expertise yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, I'm doing my research masters now and I'm starting my PhD next year. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that 40% of the research can be replicated. Well, if we assume that the met methodology of a paper is right before it gets published, or that if it's not right, that a reviewer will spot it, then we would assume that 95% would be correct. So you're saying that the, the QRPs are the reason for these, this 50% difference between what it should be and what it is? And I think QRPs are fraud. I mean, every scientist knows these three things. That just not how you conduct your experiment. So if a, a paper gets published with these QRPs, then that's fraud. So you're saying that 50% of the researchers are committing fraud in their research? Well, I disagree that to say they're fraud, and I would disagree. I mean, I would, you know, it would be nice to think we had a situation where all scientists um, thought that those things were, uh, were bad practice, but things like the importance of having an explicit stopping rule when you're c collecting data, that's not something that is necessarily universally accepted and certainly it's not something that's universally described um, in a paper so you know sort of a lot of these things I mean people don't you know sort of people don't publish in their paper ah oh, yeah you know sort of I fiddled around with these things to get a statistical significant result you need to you need to have some expertise in the methodology and be able to see where the gaps are there to be able to say ah oh, you know that's interesting there was no stopping rule was given in this paper and you know see all these these signs so um and then when it comes unfortunately the um review is a patchy process there you know i mean i think anyone that's been through peer review a few times knows that you have reviewers who will do a very good job and be very thorough on things and you have reviewers who will you know sort of wave stuff through so i mean peer review has not been the answer to this and it's i'm extremely skeptical that at any stage in the near future peer review is going to provide the answer for this kind of quality check it could do more but um it's it's not going to solve a number below 50 percent is seems insane it's it's a, and but Again, we do, like I said, this, this is clearly different in different disciplines. We don't know any, any discipline that, has, that relies extensively on null hypothesis significance testing that hasn't had a replication crisis moment and reflection is probably in trouble. On the other hand, you know, we know that, you know, sort of, 
climate science has ground up modelling that's done based on, you know, sort of well accepted physical principles that's done independently that has multiple lines of evidence that converges on it and all of which has been, you know, sort of they have now got to very open standards of scrutiny and have been extensively scrutinised by many people. Climate science is probably, you know, it's probably pretty good, um, you know, it's probably as good as it gets, but um, beyond that, we don't know. So and a chance to talk about, you know, the, in the incentives are different in different fields. So one of the reasons why preclinical medicine is a real problem is because the, you know, the, as, along with all of those incentives that I talked about, there are in particular incentives within that field to get results into clinical testing because for a start, no one wants to miss the drug that's going to cure cancer. You know, the, the, the tolerance for false, um, for false negatives is very low because we really don't want to miss anything. And unfortunately, that means that we're ending up with this massive rate of false positives as a result. Um, there are things that can be done to fix that, but they're very specific to that particular field. So there are different incentive structures going on around the place. And I suspect that broadly speaking, there are poor practice because of these incentives across most disciplines, but whether that translates into non-replicable research, it might translate instead into replicable but meaningless research or, you know, sort of into other kinds of things. Um, it, it is, it's something that we sort of, we, we don't really know how it fits so many disciplines. How do you uh, pick your papers to replicate? Well, as I said, for this project, we're not, we just don't, someone else is doing that. Is it, we, we're, that's independently that done for us. So it's not completely random, that's also It's um, stratified random. It's, it's supposedly, again, I like I'm not doing it, so I can't give you the ins and outs, but it's, well, we're assured that it's stratified random sampling. So they've got the journals that they have to pick from uh, and then they do an even selection from each journal but then within each journal it's supposedly random yeah sorry yeah um, thanks Martin uh, I've got lots of questions maybe I'll ask the most difficult one first um, <laughs> with the collaboration project it sounds like you're asking even lay people to review papers and they've got a, they've got a time limit of half an hour, but I'm wondering the quality control on the review process itself. It sounds like you've got a workshop for these people. So Can we've have a checklist, or we've done know? it. We've done it in two ways. We've done it um, in face-to-face -face workshops, in which case people get together and discuss, and that's quite interactive. But it does mean that you do have a fairly defined time limit. Um, because everyone has to do it together. We've also now got the online mode in which we don't, there's no time limit in that sense. You can spend as long on it as you feel doing it, but you know, we appreciate volunteer labor. So we're not, we don't want to sort of suck days and weeks and months of volunteer labor out of people. Um, is half an hour, um, you know, sort of long enough to do this justice? It, Probably it isn't, to be honest, um, but it does seem to be enough to get um, something. I should note that the claim is not the entire paper. The claim is one claim that's extracted from the paper. So a paper typically reports many different experiments or sub-experiments or results. This is just why this is not the paper overall is one claim. So you don't necessarily need to read the whole paper to be able to make an assessment of the particular claim. Um, but the, the, the yeah. briefing, are you accepting people who know nothing about statistics or is there, is there pre-training? Uh, there is some training available. We're a little bit loath to, we don't provide checklists, I think you mentioned, because um, we're loath to direct people to say these are the things that you need to focus on. As indicated, our experience with this kind of work is that actually a diversity of skills and experiences is works best. So if we start saying to everyone, you need quit, you need to look at these things, then we're worried that people will look at those things and not bring their own expertise. Look, I, we, um, we like people to be at least um, 
graduate students, but we will accept people even if they're um, undergraduates. Um, the standard is what I said before. We want, if people are comfortable that they can read a claim, read a paper, and make an informed judgment, opinion based on that, that's the standard of participant that we want. We don't want people obviously getting in there and going, I can't understand anything, I won't, you know, it's no good for anyone to do that. You mentioned something about then tracking the evaluations with the actual reproducibility of that paper through later reproducibility. We will know that at the end of this project, because again, it's like this is all being done at arm's length. The, we have obviously no idea what the results, we don't even know which studies are being replicated, let alone know what the results are. At the end of this phase, we will be told how well we've done. We, yeah, so we don't know. Yeah. You mentioned that there are insti institutions of science or that produce science um, have all of these incentives for the researchers who do the work to do things um, based on how they get published. So in the middle of it, I wondered why they're like the published publication houses of nature and all that stuff. Why they don't have um, safeguards like I will publish this, but only if these other five random teams, just like peer review, but it's like a long time peer review where it's like, we like, because I thought that the doing peer review of your hypothesis and then afterwards when you've done it was a really good system. So if you've agreed that it's an okay study to pursue, then why wouldn't you just go, okay, and by the way, there are five random peer review um, labs around the world. Um, and if all, if you don't all produce and give me your paper by this date, no one gets published. Like, is in like sort of a game theory style like <laughs> environment, and why? And it, and I'm asking, what is the incentive for the publication houses to not do that? Because what are what are they incentivized at the moment? I, I really don't know. I don't really know. Well, I mean, at the moment, you know, scientific publishing gets you know sort of work for free and sells it for you know sort of a reasonably hefty. <laughs> fee in some cases, so, um, you know, sort of their, uh, the incentive for them to move away from that to, to a model that requires them to do more work and more expenditure and get fewer things in, it's, it's, it's um, a tricky, that one. Um, but these, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, I mentioned these, these kinds, there have been more and more journals signing up to this, these kinds of processes. But, um, you know, sort of ultimately the sort of the big steps are only going to be taken when publications with, you know, sort of all publications within a particular field move or, you know, sort of most of them. We do need to take a sort of fairly sector wide approach to this rather than just sort of individual titles moving because, um, you know, sort of the other problem with individual titles moving is that often that's associated with particular editors and the editor will come on board and they're very enthusiastic about open science and they institute open science um, procedures for three years and then they leave and someone else comes on and, you know, sort of it's, if it hasn't been embedded into the, the entire process, then, you know, sort of the, the policies can be left on the books but not enforced for, you know, and that, that is certainly the case in a number of journals that have good policies but not much um, action behind them. Yeah. Peter Bulgosian and two of his friends wrote a lot of, about two or three years ago, and they wrote this whole series of gibberish papers and sent them off to all the scientific magazines, and Nature actually published one of them, and then they fessed up after some of these journals had published them, they fessed up and said no, they were deliberate gibberish papers which were published. Yeah, some were junk journals, some were the higher, the more of the top tier journals. There was a mix of journals. That was one of the criticisms of the Bergesian yes. um, prank. But it certainly worth it. Um, so in a lot of the models that you put forward for how we correct science or how we can do science differently to try to get more replicable studies, which I think everyone wants their study to be one of the ones that gets replicated. Um, 
A lot of it is sort of working in a small science model where you have small labs of small groups of people who are going to be in one place for one time to tackle a small specific project. How well does this translate to big science projects where the people collecting the data and the people analyzing the data, <coughs> there might be dozens and dozens of people on either side and they might be separated by years and years. So all of the data has been collected before any of it is analyzed. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question. Um, and I, you know, again, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, high energy physics is, um, you know, a classic example of that kind of thing, um, that uh, the chances of any given experiment kind of being replicated in a sense are very low because the machinery is hella expensive and there's only a few places in the world that can do them and given for a particular experiment there might be only one place in the world um, that can do it. Um, but the thing that's interesting about high energy physics is that um, they've Move because they now rely so little on actual publications, they rely on archive um, publications rather than, you know, sort of than the actual final publications. And one of the things that's doing that is because within that community, their teams are so large and so multi institution that they have so much internal review going on. So this whole process of peer review kind of becomes redundant for high energy physics because every paper that's paper has 60 lead authors spending six months arguing back and forth amongst themselves about you know sort of what can go in um, whether that's you know whether that's producing something better or worse uh, you know sort of I'm not in a position to say but um, you know sort of it highlights again that there are you know it's a very different and particular practice that's arisen out of a you know particular structure that happens in high energy physics that's not sort of directly comparable to other fields of, of study. Um, Martin, uh, with the collaboration project again, um, I'm trying to get clear on what the end goal is. So you've got all of these reviewers reviewing, I think it's 300 claims from papers, and then that's going to be matched up with the actual reproducibility of each paper. Um, is the end goal then to minimise the amount of effort, resources that go into actually doing reproducibility studies and just rely on, at the first stage, these human reviewers if and a score for each newly published page paper by human reviewers, and then later you were saying move to an algorithm, have I got that right? Well, so yeah, so there's different, different people involved with different, um, you know, sort of incentives. So uh, for DARPA, they want, so the end process of what we do is that we develop a confidence score, a score from zero to 100 for each claim. And so what DARPA wants to do as a user is they, yes, they want an algorithm that will just, any time they come up with a claim, they can feed it into their science robot and the science robot will give them a number and then DARPA will work out whether or not to trust it. Okay. For us, um, our goal, would, if our process works, then at the very least, this could be used as some kind of triaging for, um, to direct replication studies. If we can at least, say, work, distinguish this paper is clearly good quality or this paper is clearly rubbish from that messy stuff in the middle that's like this is 50-50, this could go either way. At least we could direct resources to the kinds of replication studies that need it. Um, separate to that, I mentioned the fact that the reasoning data that I'm working on, so that's that's something that's of well, it's not a, it's not of no interest to DARPA, but it's not what they're giving us money for. But that's of enormous interest to us that if we can work out what are the things that make scientists trust or distrust other people's research, then the kinds of goals, the things, the advantages for that will, first of all, um, that itself could help you know sort of direct replication studies if we can understand those factors better, but also it can lead to better quality research by scientists who take the effort to learn about this. 
um, and certainly, you know, if nothing else, better quality writing in scientific papers. And I can tell you from having now reviewed hundreds of these scientific papers from disciplines that I'd never touched before in my life, the quality of writing in scientific papers is not uniformly high. Um, the junk journals, now you haven't mentioned the junk journals at, uh, at all. Is junk journals a problem and that's being worked on or, and I'm thinking it is a problem because the people who get into junk journals, they are then cited by other junk scientists and maybe some reputable scientists who don't know that it's a junk journal. So there's a citation problem there. Is, so is anybody, is that a problem? Uh, I I think it's a problem. Um, citation, raw citation counts are a problem. Um, in principle, um, it's an easy problem to deal with in the same way that fraud is easy problem to deal with, we just disregard them. Uh, in practice, that's not so easy and it's also not so easy because um, there are um, some grey areas like um, the frontiers in publications, which are an open access suite of publications. Um, they're pay to publish, open access. Now, um, we, our research group in general, are supportive of open access publications. Open access publications do often, you know, they all need to get fees for their publication. There are some that have managed to sort of structure it in a way that those publication fees are not author facing, but author facing fees from open access publications, you know, sort of are a reality. Um, but there's a lot of people that then say, oh, if you're paying to publish in this journal, it must be a junk journal. And there have been a few frontiers in um, j titles that have had a few rocky moments in the last 10 years, but as a, you know, sort of as a whole enterprise, it's, um, you know, it's actually what we would say has many elements of the way forward, yet is being regarded as sort of a junk journal by some people or junk journal house. So, you know, sort of there are, deciding whether something actually is a junk journal can be more problematic, but in principle, you know, I would say you know, sort of disregard those journals and um, disregard raw citation counts as a proxy of quality. So the you mean the universities disregard those counts? Well, yeah, that's easy to say, but it's not, you know, that's where we get to. We need to, we need reforms in these kinds of um, appointment and promotion practices because, you know, sort of even for all the best will in the world, there's plenty of people who then walk into, um, selection committees and just look at the, you know, look at the citation count or look at, you know, the Nature article and say, oh, you know. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we believe that only one layer and listening and practical and action and people communication, not about academy, about the people. We need to go to academy knowledge about the people in the street. Anyway, Science, for me, not me, I, for we, not good science, bad science. Because if we think bad and good doesn't exist, mind created, why we call these are bad science and these are good science? Uh, well, no, I mean, I, I agree that um, that kind of dichotomous thinking um, is a problem. And, you know, I can just um, repeat. Uh, what I said that I think the uh, the way forward is to uh, understand this as a process and in this process people are going to make mistakes um, but that's fine um, people are scientists are doing something hard and we need to create a science culture amongst the people in the street that appreciates um, the difficulty of the challenge the consequence that mistakes get made but it still appreciate the kinds of good faith activities that are being done to, um, to, in order to correct that and... Yeah, about mistake, mistake very important. If you're not mistake, you are not best scientist. Mm. One thing one, I remind you, we help, we remind education for a school, higher school. This knowledge is second hand knowledge. For example, we don't know about sun. For example, we teach young children about the galaxy are wrong. 
we teach about the own atmosphere, this knowledge need be changed. But we still continue, we help these people. This, how we trust this science, because tell, you remind us, we need trust science. Because science and scientists always change dynamic and relativity. Sure, well, again, there's a whole um, suite of things there that I yeah, sort of bracketed out of the talk um, early on, but yeah, I totally agree that um, to do a, a proper, um, proper analysis of uh, where public trust in science is, we, we totally need to um, appreciate uh, where, where, um, where individuals stand in relation to, um, to, to scientific practice. And One big problem, we call it disease, we in the USA, we mix the religion by scientific. We not need to do that. We need to divide the science and the religion from each other. We mix the science and politics. We mix science by intelligent emotion. We mix science by own culture. We need to divide science from religion, from politics, from my culture, from intelligent emotion. I, I'm not a scientist, so that's why I think that my questions might seem a little bit basic, but because I don't understand this process. Um, when, when people do peer reviews, the reviewers are usually anonymous, and then like they're somewhat a peer reviewer, and then, but they're reading the paper and they see on the paper that it's, I don't know, Peter Singer or something like, and, and, and the, it's like knowing things influences people. I know this about juries, when they're, if juries, that's why the juries aren't allowed to have phones, or like go, they're, they're in hotels and they're not allowed to use TVs, like, um, because that sort of stuff influences us. Is there any extra research that your group is doing, or maybe someone else is doing, about how, like, people's media influence, because media is, like, everywhere now, telling us that, I don't know, um, all of the random bad scientific journalism that exists in the world um, that could be influencing people who are reviewing papers or people who are or people who are producing science. Like, is there anything in that is related to that? Um, so to start off with uh, the the most common model is single blind review. So the reviewer is blind; you don't know who the reviewer is, but the reviewer knows the um, identity of the paper. Less common but not uncommon is double blind review. So review that where the um, author's credentials get taken off the paper before it gets sent to the reviewer. In many cases, particularly in specific fields, it's pretty easy for someone in the know to work out which lab a particular piece of work was done at or who was doing it. So the efficacy of double blind reviews in at least some um, uh, some areas is, um, you know, sort of considered questionable. The other thing, which is what Frontiers does, is open review. And th this is much less common, but there are, um, you know, a few places that do, and that's where the identity of the reviewers is open. They have to put their name to the review. And, you know, there are arguments against that, but there are also really compelling arguments for it. Um, and just one, is that actually a really good peer review is itself a fantastic contribution to knowledge and to the scientific process. And there are a lot of really excellent reviews that make really good observations, points, improve the process that are just, they get written and then that's it, they disappear, they sort of, you know, like seen by even fewer people than your PhD thesis, you know. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, sort of they're moving to an open review model where those kinds of comments are actually kept and published um, is something that we think there's a lot of promise. In terms of, there are, there is a small but, you know, sort of flourishing-ish field of um, studies of peer review. It's pretty small. There's no one in, oh, no, there's no one in our group doing that kind of research. There's some people doing some other stuff on peer reviews, but yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah.